Welcome to this presentation on bone tissue. Now, this is a tissue that can be overlooked sometimes in anatomy. From a gross anatomical perspective, it looks like sticks that muscles attach to and act upon. Despite its static appearance, however, at the microscopic level, it's a dynamic tissue that is constantly repairing and remodeling itself. It's also one of only two tissues in the body that heals without leaving any scarring. We'll be looking into many of these properties as we look at the overall microanatomy of bone tissue and how it changes as bone ages and matures, which is the topic of the first segment. This is an ideal time to be starting into a discussion of bone tissue, having just finished up the session on cartilage. A number of similarities exist between the two tissues on a microscopic level. For both tissue types, we have a collection of cells encased in a tissue matrix they help produce, containing collagen and proteoglycans. This similarity is in part because the majority of bones in the body initially began as cartilaginous models that hardened over time. This hardening is referred to as ossification and is something we'll discuss as we move through the session. For any given bone, the tissue exists in two distinct morphologies. The outer portion is typically solid and is referred to as the cortical or compact bone. This is what provides bone with its strength and resistive formation from external forces. The inner cavity of most bones is composed of cancellous or spongy bone. As the name implies, it has a porous appearance that is typically filled with bone marrow. This serves to decrease the overall weight of the bone which helps with body movements. From gross anatomy, we learn that bones come in all shapes and sizes. Long bones are found throughout the appendages and create fulcrums for the more dramatic movements. At either end of a typical long bone is a physis or a growth plate. As we'll see later on, this allows for bidirectional growth away from the central axis. At either end, an epiphysis lies distal to the physis and is typically involved in joint articulations. The epiphysis has a thin shell of compact bone surrounding a core of cancellous bone. The shaft of a long bone lies between the two growth plates and is referred to as the diaphysis. The cortical bone is much thicker in the diaphysis with trace amounts of cancellous bone lining the inner surface. The central core of the diaphysis is hollow, containing bone marrow in the living. In contrast, the short bones that make up the base of the hands and feet are typically more dense with variable amounts of cancellous bone surrounded by a thick shell of cortical bone. Despite the differences in their physical appearance, the microstructure of cancellous and cortical bone is essentially identical for all different bone types. The matrix of bone itself is composed of equal parts organic and inorganic matrix. Each component has its own unique characteristics, which contribute to the overall physical properties of bone. The organic component is made of proteins and glycoproteins, similar to those discussed with cartilage. There are some differences in the specific glycoproteins found in bone. Osteocalcin is a glycoprotein with an affinity for calcium ions. This helps to concentrate calcium ions on bone, which would not be desirable in cartilage. The organic matrix is what gives bone its flexibility. This flexibility is best appreciated when we look at the properties of bone following cremation. The cremation process burns off the organic components of bone, leaving only the inorganic component behind. Following cremation, the bones become incredibly brittle and are easily ground down to leave a fine dust of inorganic materials. The inorganic component is made up of a number of ionic minerals. The most important of these is hydroxyapatite, which is formed from the interaction of positively charged calcium and negatively charged phosphate. This is what gives bone its strength and rigidity. If you have ever seen the science experiment in which an egg is left to soak in vinegar for a period of several days, the shell becomes rubbery over time. This is because the vinegar leaches out the inorganic minerals from the egg's shell leaving only collagen and glycoprotein matrix behind. A similar phenomenon is seen with bone tissue, in which removal of the inorganic matrix makes the bone malleable, and similar to cartilage and its physical properties. A clinical example of this phenomenon is seen with rickets. This is the result of a vitamin D deficiency that negatively affects the bone's ability to absorb and store hydroxyapatite. The decreased mineralization results in increased pliability and deformity of bone tissue. 
The femur is particularly affected due to its weight-bearing function, resulting in genuvarous or bow-leggedness as the femur becomes deformed under the body's weight. While cartilage has a uniform matrix, mature bone tissue is much more organized into functional units known as osteons. The osteon is a long cylindrical structure which resembles a tree trunk in cross-section, containing four to ten concentric rings of bone matrix, with bone cells embedded in lacunar cavities between each ring. The lacunae are interconnected through porous channels called canaliculi, which contain cytoplasmic extensions that allow communication between cells throughout the osteon. As we'll see, each ring is formed independently. The outer rings are formed first and serve as a scaffold for the formation of inner rings later on. The collagen in each ring is laid down in a spiraling fashion, with the direction of spiral alternating between adjacent rings to create perpendicular layers of collagen. This creates great tensile strength against the torsional forces in each direction. The hollow central core of the osteon is referred to as the central canal. It contains a neurovascular bundle that courses along the length of the osteon column, providing nutrients to the inner lamella of the osteon. These nutrients pass through the canaliculi to make it to the cells in more peripheral lamella. In addition to the central canals, we also see large perforating or Volkmann canals that span from one osteon to another, interconnecting the central canals. This allows branches from the main neurovascular supply found within the central core to project out to all osteons found within the bone tissue. The outermost lamella for each osteon makes contact with those from other osteons at points called the cement line. Along the perimeter of the bone, there are four to six circumferential lamellae that wrap around the full outer margin of the bone. Superficial to these circumferential lamella, the outer bone surface is covered with a layer of dense irregular connective tissue called periosteum, similar to perichondrium seen in most hyaline cartilage. The periosteum covers a combination of osteoprogenitor cells that serve as a stem cell reservoir for generating more bone producing cells and fibroblasts that synthesize the periosteal matrix. The inner surface has its own covering, a thin membrane of only a single cell layer called the endosteum. There isn't a comparable feature in cartilage due to the fact that cartilage has a solid matrix. As mentioned at the start of the segment, bone is not a static tissue. Despite its rigid appearance, 5 to 10 percent of bone tissue is reformed every year. This assists in replacing worn out tissue with microfractures to the bone matrix. Think about any time you've done remodeling of your home whether it's a kitchen, bathroom, or a basement. The room is torn up, old materials thrown out, and replaced with new. But from the outside of the house, nothing looks different. That's what's happening with bone, except that the renovations never stop. The remodeling is also responsive to surrounding forces in the area of the bone. For example, the wearing of orthodontic braces places forces on teeth that result in the remodeling of gomphoses to better accommodate tooth roots. This remodeling requires an array of cells to break down old bone material, build up new bone material, and maintain the matrix environment. Some of the cells involved in this process evolve from a specific type of stem cell, the osteoprogenitor cell. These develop from the mesenchymal stem cells found in both the periosteal and endosteal layers and can be thought of as a further specialized type of stem cell, similar to a student continuing in graduate studies. These cells are highly proliferative, ensuring that there is a constant supply of cells available to differentiate into bone-forming cells. Osteoprogenitor cells are small and round, with the majority of volume taken up by the nucleus. As they are not actively producing matrix, the endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus are not extensively developed just yet. A portion of the osteoprogenitor cell population is constantly being converted into osteoblast cells. These are the workers, similar to the chondroblasts seen in cartilage, which constantly lay down organic bone matrix, called osteoid, in the formation of new bone tissue. This includes type 1 collagen, proteoglycans, the osteocalcin mentioned earlier, and alkaline phosphatase, which generates phosphate ions for generation of hydroxyapatite.
This as of yet uncalcified matrix appears as a faint line between the active osteoblasts and previously calcified matrix. Under the microscope, osteoblasts are cuboidal in shape. With electron microscopy, we see a more highly developed endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus, reflecting the secretory function of the cell. The cell also appears polarized, with the ER and Golgi at one pole and the nucleus at the other. This is because matrix is secreted directly into pre-existing bone tissue from the ER and Golgi side. The nuclear side faces outward, away from the surface of the bone. Although osteoblasts primarily secrete towards the bone surface, a small amount of matrix is secreted away from the bone surface, which serves as a platform for other osteoblasts to bind and secrete onto. This effectively seals the previous osteoblasts within the matrix, forming the lacuna. At this phase, the osteoblast further differentiates into the retired osteocyte. Similar to the chondrocytes from the previous session, these cells maintain the local matrix and are involved in minor repairs of the matrix tissue. Osteocytes appear smaller in size compared to the osteoblasts, with condensed endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus. This reflects a reduced rate of matrix protein production. They also develop cytoplasmic extensions that burrow through the unmineralized matrix prior to calcification. This results in the canaliculi seen in mature bone tissue. One final cell that plays a critical role in bone remodeling has a distinct cellular lineage. Osteoclasts are large, multinucleated cells formed from the fusion of four or five separate bone marrow cells. These are the cells responsible for the resorption of older matrix. Going back to our home renovation analogy, the remodeling can't take place until the outdated room is demolished. The same idea applies here. Under the light microscope, these large cells are found embedded in furrows within the bone matrix called resorption bays, which are generated by the osteoclasts themselves. The contact surface has a ruffled appearance, with the periphery of the zone rich in actin, which facilitates adhesion to the bone like a suction cup. This allows osteoclasts to secrete acids and proteolytic enzymes on the surface of the bone without leakage into the medullary cavity. That will do it for this segment on general bone histology. In our next segment, we will consider the development of bone from either mesenchymal tissue or a cartilaginous model and the continued growth of bone throughout adolescence.